Uh, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Is it working? OK, perfect. Great. So um, we are having two presentations, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, both presentations, we have uh, prepared them to, together. We discuss it in advance. Um, uh, the, the presentations we had uh, earlier this morning were more focused on character education or uh, mentoring. Here, let's say we are going to uh, broaden the scope of the, of the topic, uh, connecting it to um, the idea of having a core curriculum in a university, the use of Cortex. Emma will later um, say more about Cortex and, or gradebooks. So Cortex and gradebooks are just um, synonyms or two ways of referring to the same thing. Um, and I'll try to keep it brief so that we have time for Q&A, which I think is the, might be the most interesting part. But I, I would like first to, to begin with a very general um, remark or, or considerations about um, ethical and character education in universities, because I think both are connected. We, we've been talking even yes, yesterday afternoon a lot about character education, but that's part of moral or ethical education. And I think it's helpful um, to keep this in mind and don't, don't forget that. So if, if, we, if I were um, to, to give um, um, uh, yeah, an outline of the connection between character and moral education, I think we can all agree that uh, moral education, and mo by moral I also mean ethical, if that uh, makes some um, kind of uh, misunderstanding. So moral or ethical education includes lear learning how to reason ethically or in ethical matters, or you can call that also moral theory. Um, in um, in an educational setting like a university, that will also include professional ethics or, ap or applied ethics, if, if you prefer. And then, of course, character education, which we are discussing today as the main topic. And so what's the connection between character and moral education? I think it's pretty straightforward, the, the answer one can uh, find or give. Uh, that is, uh, character is morality in practice. So you can learn you know, ethics, you can learn, learn uh, professional ethics, you can know how to apply moral principles to a professional practice. That's one thing you can learn, so you know that. But another different thing is whether you actually do it and how you, you, you manage to do it. Uh, so here we have the theory and the practice of ethics. And of course, ethics uh, always need this practical side. Um, and yeah, I think this, uh, this is my first um, remark. Secondly, I will very briefly and quickly um, um, call your attention to this a very interesting book that was published 10 years ago. Probably most of you have heard of it, of it or even read it. Uh, which is Deba Debating Moral Education, Rethinking the Role of the Modern University by Kiss and Oven. Uh, it's a collection of essays um, after a, a number of years of seminars that they were uh, having at um, the University of North Carolina, if I'm right, uh, with um, different and competing and even opposing uh, positions with regard to the place of ethical education in modern secular or relig religious universities. But um, in the introduction, and all these uh, ideas I'm going to mention very briefly are to be found in the introduction to the volume, um, they um, uh, explain why today, and by today we can mean that in the past 20 years, uh, there has been a return to ethics in uh, universities. And so the question is why? And here are a number of reasons. First of all is that Science is no longer understood as a value-free activity, as it, I mean, uh, uh, it was thought to be, say, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Uh, we are aware that it has ethical implications or um, there is no value-free activity uh, if it is a human activity and science is a human activity. So it has ethical implications, ethical presuppositions, hidden or not, but the other. Secondly, um, most universities, especially in the United States, um, throughout the 20th century will claim that they are preparing uh, students for democratic citizenship. But the, the interesting thing is that in the past 30 to 50 years, the question of uh, what does democracy mean today um, has uh, arisen. So we need to discuss that. <laughs> when, 
uh, in order to uh, prepare citizens for democracy. So th there is the, the, and the question, the question is open. Then um, effective volitional and behavioral capacities are nowadays um, acknowledged as important as cognitive one in terms of um, professional practice. So it's not just that you, you are, you know, to be a good engineer, you also need to be able to um, team group or things like that. Um, also, uh, um, uh, programs um, like service learning have become very popular, and that all, of course, has you know, um, this um, ethical dimension embedded in, in them. Um, and also, more relevant to what we're discussing here today, is that we have become more aware of the performative dimensions of teaching. Um, and I will only mention one, is that, which is that teachers, willingly or not, are role models. So we have an impact on the students. Um, and we need to reflect on that. So that, that's why we need to at least give space to ethical um, reflection. And then, uh, and in connection to this uh, last point I just mentioned, is that it seems that we need to find a kind of middle ground between uh, moral indoctrination um, and value neutrality. So value neutrality is not possible, so it's not real, actually, and I will mention that later, right, right away. Um, institutions have always uh, an agenda, even if it's hidden, so there is no value neutrality in institutions, nor in teaching. But of course, I mean, when you talk about ethical teaching and character education, our risk is uh, transforming that or, or going uh, towards the way of indoctrination uh, that does not respect freedom or Think of those kinds of problems which are unethical. So here we have again the problem. And so finally, um, nowadays, and Ed Brooks um, mentioned that also in his presentation, spirituality and religion are, uh, uh, I don't know whether in this country yet, but in other countries for sure, and I think here it will come too, as uh, spirituality and religion are acknowledged as part of moral education or, or, or at least of what is important for students. And if it's important for students and we care about the students, um, then we need to take that into account. And of course, um, at least the, I mean, in the, the main uh, religious traditions, uh, they, they all have an ethical um, element or, or content or principle. I already mentioned that any university has a so-called hidden curriculum uh, that can be experience or seen or studied in their campus practices, regulations, decisions, norms. And they, of, of course, contribute to the student's development for the better or for the worse. Um, two examples of this, very well known, but not the least I mean, uh, relevant, is, are the debates on free speech um, and on safe spaces. Just to give one example, but we're just talking about the cafeteria menu, uh, whether it's healthy or not, whether I mean, meat is good or not. These are ethical issues too, for students. I mean, maybe, yeah, for students, let's put that away. Okay. Let's leave it there. Um, so um, for all these reasons, uh, they conclude, and I, and I agree with them, that the question is not whether colleges and universities should pursue moral education, but how. So they, they are pursuing it. So the question is how we do it. And the, the, the more we... Um, think about it, the better we, we will be able to answer and to address this um, um, aspect of university life. Okay, it was, this was the longest part. I have par five um, mm, uh, points, thank you, or items. So why a core curriculum? Um, I, I'm the director of the Core Curriculum Institute. I've been there for the past 10 years, more or less. Um, so I will give, I want, I mean, I would love to explain you a lot about it and how we enjoy it, uh, but I will um, give only two, um, two slides. The first one, which is this one, to make some clarifications, um, and the second one to give an insight on, on why is it uh, so, I would say, relevant uh, and even decisive uh, for a university interested in uh, providing, providing um, a good education, a whole round education, including ethical education. Okay, so for clarification, um, these three concepts, liberal education, liberal arts, and core curriculum, um, they are not complete synonyms. Um, they have different uh, meanings. 
usually liberal arts and sciences. And Mark will talk more about why sciences can or should be included here. Uh, usually mean uh, or means that um, we are talking about a complete BA program. So three or four years of study in the liberal arts uh, instead of in economics or in philosophy. That's what usually mean by a liberal arts education or a liberal arts program. Um, when we talk about or use the word core curriculum, uh, most commonly that means that we have a professional BA program, say a degree in business administration, a degree in engineering, a degree in philosophy, where there is, for instance, one year or half a year or two years of core curriculum or common curriculum, uh, required courses for any student regardless of uh, his or her major. And this curriculum is um, mostly based in the humanities, but also in science. We can get to, it, to that later. Okay, that's, that was the first um, clarification I think I needed to make. And the second one is, so what do we understand by liberal education? Um, because that's, that's also <laughs> tricky, interesting, and complicated. And my, my position in this is that there is no one definition on what liberal education is. But if I were to give one, which I need to do, um, I would say that these two um, uh, definitions will help us to, um, to understand what the education is. First, it's a kind of education where knowledge is valued not only for its usefulness, but as an, ed as an end in itself. This sounds highly theoretical, highly philosophical, but that's what it is. So, if, um, uh, and secondly, and I think it's more, this is more practical, is that um, it's a kind of education that provides not only professional training, but also education of the whole person. And here comes what's relevant for our discussion, including both intellectual and moral formation. So the second part, the moral formation, is what uh, we have become aware or more aware in the, in the past years. Um, and I think that's um, relevant and interesting and worth um, pursuing and discussing. Okay, and then about the, so why a core curriculum? What does it add to education? Why is it so relevant? And um, later I'll talk, why is it so uncommon in uh, the Spanish speaking countries? And so I mean Latin America. Um, so why is it relevant? Why is it uh, valuable? First, because I mean, through a core curriculum, you help students to, um, um, or you introduce students in the uh, intellectual and cultural tradition, uh, which I would say that's the end of education, um, if education has an end. Um, secondly, and this is kind of reply to common um, criticism, is that so in a core curriculum, you, has, you are not just uh, providing information on the history of art, the history of philosophy, who was Socrates, um, etc., but you are trying to create a context for a context of learning for life. And this, I mean, I have colleague, colleagues that do not agree to that. They say, I mean, if you are teaching, you are teaching. And if you are um, uh, trying to help students learn about life, that's something else, like in coaching or in mentoring. And I, I disagree with that. So I, I think uh, there are courses in the university. I do teach some of them where, I mean, my objective is, is teaching them the history of ethics or whatever. But in a core curriculum course, um, of course, you are teaching um, authors and texts and the tradition. But it should be, should include, or it should help students, or it should, yeah, it should um, help create a context where students can learn about um, how to live. Or... Okay, and then another common criticism is that, yeah, fine, but you know, in one year, tops um, uh, having six courses, one in philosophy, one in art, one in science, uh, that these are just introductions, um, and in a sense they are, for sure. We are not majoring in, in, in each of these uh, subjects or area. But a good core curriculum program and a good, good core curriculum course should not just be an introduction. And what do I mean by this? Um, by this I mean that you need excellent professors, so TAs are not um, the best option for uh, teaching a core curriculum. Um, uh, sadly, that's the case in most universities, at least as far as I know in the States, that these courses are you know, given to those who are beginning, but not full professors. Um, 
I think that's, that's a huge mistake because you need, I mean, people who have experience, who have science, and who are capable of uh, going directly to the relevant questions and issues of the topic and helping students see them. Of course, you are not covering you know, the whole uh, area, but you open up it so that the student can later on, um, by he or, him or herself, um, understand it. And then finally, so we all like this word, Socratic method. Uh, and we would you know, um, speak about it for a um, whole day. Uh, of course, that's the method that we all need. I won't say anything else. Um, only that there are different ways of understanding that, and it's worth discussing. But um, I, I'll, I'll leave it there because we don't have much time. So uh, moving forward, I will say a couple of ideas about the great books program we have at the University of Navarra. Um, very briefly, one is that it is quite new. Now it's seven years old, but already established. So by now, we, each school, any student can take the great books program. Um, that means that they can take four semesters in um, uh, seminars of um, great books. Um, another uh, thing I wanted to mention is that from the very beginning, we were lucky to find and, and collaborate and learn and benefit from uh, the Association for Cortex and Courses. And wh why do I mean this? Not just because we are grateful, um, but because I think this is crucial. I mean, if you are beginning this kind of program, you need to partner with other institutions that uh, are doing this, and the, or associations in this case. So right now we have 700 students at the university um, enrolled in the Great Books program. And that's about, that means that yeah, around 15% um, of each class do choose it. So in, in our case, the Great Books program is elective, not as in other universities like Columbia, where it's compulsory. I would say that for our context, um, which I, I will refer to right now, so of Napoleonic or French tradition of education, making it elective, it's the, 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 the right choice. Uh, because otherwise, I don't see it working, at least for the time being. Okay, then. Um, so briefly, uh, uh, we all know, um, I mean, if we know a little bit about the history of the university, that there are four, three or four traditions of uh, higher education. Um, the, the British one, you know, um, we'll get into them, of course. Um, the German, uh, the, um, the French, and then the American, which is a kind of combination of the German and the uh, British. Uh, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Latin America belong to the Napoleonic, and by Napoleon, I mean because it was Napoleon who you know, designed the whole thing, um, tradition of education. What is its main feature? That universities for professional training, even for uh, the training of civil servants, that was in the origin, how, how it started. So that's fine in a sense, but terrible <laughs> for the purpose you know, of um, having a core curriculum, making the gains for a core curriculum. But, um, uh, and, and for instance, a common uh, criticism is that, is that uh, this is an American thing. They do that in the States, but they are so different. Why do we need to do this? Or no, having a great books course. Um, and it's true that uh, our students, when they get to the university, they are not used to uh, seminar-based courses. So discussion or writing papers, and that's a ch challenge. It's a challenge, but at the same time, it's an opportunity because they, they do learn some things that are really important for the education. Um, so what, what, uh, finally, uh, which are the results uh, we, we, uh, we have after seven years? Um, first is that I, I mean, we, we have helped students to read and teach them how to read. Um, also how to build arguments in writing and speaking. And then how to dialogue in the class. I mean, a meaningful dialogue. We have um, uh, made some um, assessment and the, the, the outcomes are positive. And then finally, uh, which is I think um, uh, also relevant, we have built a network um, uh, that provides institutional support. Um, and here I would like to mention the Association for Cortex and Courses, and also what's called <laughs> the European Liberal Arts Initiative, which is a grander name, but it's just a group of professors who are, we are uh, organizing um, uh, bi-yearly conference in Europe promoting uh, the use of cortex in education. So far we have had three uh, conferences. The first one was 
in Emma's institution. And the third one was in Pamplona, the second one was in Winchester, and the fourth one hopefully will be also in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is um, something that's happening here in Europe. So uh, by this I mean um, yeah, that, that it can be done and that there is interest in this. So finally, um, for, um, so I think having a core curriculum within the tradition of uh, uh, the French tradition of higher education is possible and I think even more necessary than in other traditions. Um, if someone were to ask me how best, how can we best help our students, and if I had only one uh, sentence to say, I would, I, I would reply by introducing them to the art of reflective reading, because that's, that's the way you open up um, uh, a whole new world, in a sense, world of edu edu educative world. So very quickly, um, when we focus on moral education, um, we um, find this problem that I mentioned in the beginning, that is this indoctrination. So this is a kind of reply to that question. And I'm following here David Kors, this paper, but he has other publications. On this. I must say that this is referred to secondary education, but in this case, I think it's applicable to uh, higher education too. And so very briefly, because I mean, we're running out of time, um, basically what David Carr says is that you have two ways of yeah, approaching moral education as a teacher or as an institution. One is the liberal in yeah, both American, yeah, American sense of liberal, like, I mean, neutrality, each one thinks what he or she wants, there is no um, uh, canon or, or, or yeah. Uh, and the other one is the paternalist, like, you know, I have the truth, I know what's right, you are here, you are my student, you are my pupil, so uh, get ready to, to learn what's uh, to be done in life. Both of them um, are wrong. Uh, why? And I think this is very interesting because he explains very um, nicely that in both um, uh, possibilities, the teacher um, somehow uh, does, um, uh, it's like he, he leaves something that is his or her responsibility. Um, um, by this, I mean that the teacher cannot be morally neutral um, or, or neither a transmitter of the defined values of the given institution or in a case that the institution has not given uh, values but, um, or defined values, sorry, uh, her or his uh, personal values. So neither option is, seems to be right. What's the right option? The right option is like, I mean, a human being as a teacher, I have moral ideas. If I teach ethics, of course I have opinions on this. And not just opinions, I have arguments of this. And, I'm, and we are going to discuss them, I'm going to present them. But in which way? Uh, not a didactic in the sense of top down, to put it uh, briefly, but dialogical, so Socratic again. What does this mean? We can discuss it later. Um, and I, I think this, this sentence is uh, illuminating. Um, I read it out. Um, so what, after all, are students likely to learn about moral stances from someone who claims that for the purposes of the classroom, he or she has none? Doesn't make any sense. That would, that would be the liberal consensus, but it really does, doesn't make any sense. So finally, um, and this is very briefly, this is just, um, I think it's very nice that we um, uh, are here together, people working on different areas, like in the two and call program, mentoring program, um, because um, if we are thinking about how to help students, how to provide you know, ethical education or character education, which is a part of ethical education, we cannot just um, stay on one, of, on one side or the other of uh, what the student receives at the university. We need to work together to combine the different, I would, I would call them levels. And by this I mean, um, I have, um, yeah, this is one, the last, last slide. So the first idea is that, uh, I hope we all agree, is that virtues cannot be taught as such. This is a huge topic in moral philosophy, that they cannot be taught. But professors, can, professors and other students, and this is relevant, so not only professors or teachers, but also students, can act as midwives. But we need to create the conditions for that. And for that, we need community. That's the, the, the name of, I would like to argue here for. 
Um, so create communities where ethical principles can be put into practice. So the idea is that the university itself is not just a preparation for the real life that comes after you graduate, but this is also real life. This is a real community of persons where we live. Even if we live together, that's great, but even if you just you know, go to class together, you are living together. So you can um, put into practi practice ethical, ethical principles and learn them by experience from role models, examples, situations, et cetera. And then finally, uh, I, I mentioned that I think it's helpful to talk about um, at least three levels of education. I can say four. Four will be the more professional, technical um, uh, contents of engineering or philosophy. The core curriculum will be the more you know, um, education or, or, or yeah, courses directed towards ethical education or humanistic education or liberal education. Then we have extracurricular activities. We are not for credit, which are free, and these are essential because they help create this community. You are in a, in a setting where you know you may yeah you know the professor is not giving you a grade, etc. And finally, but nonetheless uh, very important, uh, mentoring. So the, the, I mean, the, these programs are necessary if we really want to to achieve um, this end. So thank you very much. <laughs>